Well, welcome everyone to a town hall focused on the Great Plains and the COVID-19 pandemic. We can do this Indian country. I'm David Knoyer. I'm sitting in the Twin City suburbs of Minnesota, and it's been great to host a number of these, a series of town halls across Indian country. And we're really focused on COVID-19 vaccination uptake and how do we how do we take on COVID-19 and do what we can to, to win? Uh, the numbers have been changing in the last couple of weeks, and we're going to talk about the so-called Delta variant, the COVID-19 variant, which is uh, increasing uh, infections and hospitalizations across the country. But we're particularly going to focus today on the plains all the way from North Dakota down to Oklahoma. And uh, if you're watching from anywhere, we would love to hear your comments during uh, our conversation for the next uh, 90 minutes or so. Uh, David Knoyer, I am enrolled Rosebud Sioux, right in our target population. My Knoyer name is from Yankton. The campaign is sponsored by the Department of Health and Human Services and the Indian Health Service. And our promotional partner for tonight's discussion is the Great Plains Tribal Chairman's Health Board, uh, directed by Geraldine Church and based in Rapid City, but serving uh, the, the South Dakota and region. And we're going to hear from a couple folks uh, connected with the health board. Uh, we can do this Indian country as a campaign, and there's more information uh, on resources to help you and your family and friends have a conversation uh, about the vaccine, about the state of the pandemic, about this Delta variant. We can do this at HHS. Let's uh, show a little clip here of of the campaign, which has uh, featured information, websites, uh, paid media, radio, uh, some print ads, as well as social media. This uh, campaign has popped up on my Facebook feed now for a few months. And let's get a little clip of something that might have popped up on your social media in the last few weeks. History, strength, resilience, vaccines, modern day warriors. Together, we overcome. Wow, that's a lot of uh, a lot of American Indian, a lot of uh, Indian country packed into fifteen seconds, and it's uh, it's been something, right, to watch the pandemic in twenty twenty. Uh, stay at home, mask up, uh, really uh, having to social distance, uh, stay at home, be safe, uh, elbow bumps, right, instead of hugs. And we thought we were out of the woods, right? We thought we were out of the woods in the last couple months as uh, those orders changed, not in every place, but, you know, Walmart, you didn't have to wear your mask anymore. Uh, many restaurants, uh, if you're vaccinated, you don't have to wear a mask. At least that's what we thought. But now with this Delta variant, the situation is changing. And I'd like to get right to our first guest tonight, uh, Nicholas Hill, who's an epidemiologist, a master of public health with the Great Plains Tribal Chairman's Health Board, who's joining us tonight from uh, Rapid City, uh, also known as Rapid. And Nicholas, thanks for your time tonight. What's the state of the COVID-19 pandemic and vaccinations in the tribal communities that the health board serves? It's a privilege and honor to be able to serve our 18 tribes and service areas spanning the Great Plains area of the two Dakotas, Nebraska and Iowa, and our health board, which is owned and operated by these service and tribes. We've seen these tribal communities as a whole work really, really hard to shut out COVID-19 and many were successful um, at doing this. In the first year, the first wave, there were three waves of COVID, uh, especially compared to some of the other tribal lands in other parts of our country, which were so adversely affected. Uh, but compared to the makeup of their population in each of the states, they still bore the excess burden of the cases, hospitalizations, and deaths by a few percentage points. Uh, and this means those exceptionally strong efforts to shut out the virus uh, were still, with those efforts, they were 
communities and people are still being heavily impacted, uh, more than average for all of the races uh, in the region. And tragically, many communities, we have to say, very clearly lost valued elders and Lakota language speakers. And so even with that impact, the status right now is that, yes, we've had a low activity summer, just like last summer. But unfortunately, we may be lulled into some false sense of security in that. Uh, those decision makers that you know indicated, like CDC, uh, that masks could be taken off, uh, we're looking at the data. You know, we use data to drive our decisions. But now, with the uptick of Delta, we have to relook at that data again and start planning and preparing for what's ahead. I think that has been one of the challenges, right, all along. That um, we didn't have a magic wand at the beginning, and then once people did get a vaccine, I thought there probably was maybe a sense that okay, uh, I'm one and done. I'm good. But with this coronavirus, right, we knew that there were going to be variants and, and uh, adaptations of the, vir uh, the virus. And, and we tried to talk about that right at the beginning, that the situation could change, which has got to be frustrating, right, to a lot of people who might feel that uh, um, unfair or, or, you know, they've changed the game on us. But... I think if we paid attention, right, those those warnings have been there from from the beginning. Um, nationally, not necessarily in the tribes, the 18 tribes of the health board, but nationally looking at the entire population, infections and hospitalizations are increasing. And they're showing that of those, 80% are due uh, to the Delta variant. You mentioned the CDC, the Centers for Disease Control, and today the, the woman who runs that said the country is at another pivotal point in the pandemic. What can you tell us about the significance of this Delta variant, Nicholas, and why it's worrisome? Yeah, sure. Thanks for that question, David. And it's, you know, it's probably higher than 80% of diagnosed infections are the Delta variant now. It's probably closer to 85 to 90 percent of all infections. We'll hear updates about that soon, probably with the next day or two. But I'd say it's very worrisome because this is a virus we cannot afford to underestimate. It's more infectious and in fact, at least 60% more infectious than any previous variant. And it can colonize or infect tissues of our body at over a thousand times the level as the original strain. And that's bad news for anyone whose immune system is not ready or unprepared for it because that level of virus can overwhelm a person. So uh, nationally, we have seen a tripling of cases just compared to a couple weeks ago with hospitalizations and deaths increasing. And I'd really actually point to the United Kingdom to inform what we're going to see because it's worked before looking at what has happened in a uh, jurisdiction somewhere globally where they first are uh, facing a new variant. And what we see is the death rate has increased sixfold in the last couple of months in the United Kingdom. Even during the summer months when we don't expect to see COVID and other respiratory diseases to be all that bad. Uh, and those age over 65 and older are still making up the majority of those cases, but there's something in the undertow, something below the surface that's not being discussed as much. And it's this the death rate is higher in the younger people than what it was during the previous waves. Uh, in fact, the death rate in the 15 to 19 year old, the high school age is twice what it was in January in the United Kingdom. So what we think is happening is that the unvaccinated youth are being um, drivers of this pandemic and are being heavily impacted by it. We've said before, get vaccinated for your elders, but we need to change that narrative a little bit. Now we need to say, get vaccinated for the youth. We need to start looking. And even though those numbers of deaths are small in number, the rate, the rate per population, those younger age groups, they're heavily affected. And as for the youth, you know, they have to remember that COVID doesn't have to put you on a ventilator to ruin your life. It can leave you permanently disabled in various organ systems, lungs, heart, vascular, or the blood system. 
It's not time to act all brave and pretend we're invincible. Now is the time to prepare and plan and protect yourself from that Delta variant. So we need, do need to really make pe people aware uh, that this is coming and it's coming pretty aggressively, unfortunately. You make a good point there, uh, Nicholas, that at the beginning of the pandemic, uh, Indian country was largely focused on elders, right? Culture bearers. Uh, we we hold elders in high regard, right? In in native communities, uh, and it said that uh, elders and young children are closest to the Creator, right? With their wisdom and knowledge and uh, spirit too. Uh, where do the vaccines fit? And before we get to, here, let's let's ask this question on the on the screen. We have a question here, Nicholas. Um, a recent report for the Oglala Sioux tribe says that they're at 26% vaccination rates and Rosebud around the same. Does that sound accurate? Um, I know we're going to hear from Gail Knutson later, who's literally on the front lines of putting uh, needles in arms, but does that sound about right from what you're hearing there at the health board? Uh, you know, I, I would uh, point to each of the tribal health directors and those who are in the leadership in those uh, tribes to be able to, you know, verify those numbers. Sure. Uh, what I can say is, you know, yeah, there are some of our tribes have reasonably high vaccination rates, some even higher than the average for the United States. But uh, we're not doing that great overall. Some are much lower. And considering that some of these tribes worked very closely together and the community came together and did a pretty good job at suppressing transmission and they're nowhere near herd immunity right now with low vaccination rates that could spell trouble for these communities yeah and i appreciate um you know we we don't want to call out any particular tribal community uh and and point fingers or anything like that but those two tribes are among the largest in South Dakota, uh, along with Standing Rock and Cheyenne River. So uh, we'll, maybe Gail Knutson, who we're going to have on a little later, uh, a nurse who's been on the uh, vaccine task force, uh, can, can help us. Uh, but the question is, why take the vaccine, Nicholas? What, what, are we, what do we know, right? Because we've had a lot of misinformation. Uh, about the vaccine, some concern that it was uh, sort of rushed to market in the testing, uh, other things about, you know, this is going to put a microchip in me and change me forever, a lot of stuff that's been out there. But but what's the, the science showing about the, vac about the vaccines in general and specifically with this Delta variant? Right. Okay. This is a very complicated topic. I'll try to do my best to address this, but what I will say is that the new vaccine platforms, these messenger RNA vaccines are exceedingly effective. Big question is, are they safe? All indications of all of the research globally are now saying conclusively and in agreement, they are safe. Uh, they're safe from the standpoint that what they do is they, um, they do not interfere, interfere or in any way impact the genetics or the genes or the makeup of the person, the DNA. What's happening is they're an RNA, which cannot integrate with DNA anyway, but they're a small segment of the code for the COVID spike protein. And all it's doing is it's, if you think about it in terms of, let's say, uh, let's say an organization, my, my, the tribal of Great Plains Tribal Health Board here, we have uh, protected areas of this uh, health board, like the server room that contains all of the mission plans, all of everything that's saved uh, securely for the organization. When the vaccine is given, if we think about it in terms of being like this building, that vaccine never goes into that server room. It goes over to the copier and it runs off a few copies, you know, many copies, of a spike protein on the specific place where a copier is there and only meant to be there for one purpose, which is to make proteins. And it just simply utilizes the copier that's already there, produces spike protein. It's clean and it's simple. Because it's so clean and simple, it eliminates the possibility for lots of other things that are unexpected to go wrong. 
because of that, my belief is we need to start moving a lot more of our vaccines into this type of a platform, this kind of messenger RNA vaccine platform. This is not new technology. It's been studied for nearly 30 years, 25 at least. It just hasn't had the chance to maybe get anywhere because so many clinical trials have been done or have to be done. And in many had been and much was being done with cancer research with messenger RNA vaccine technology. It, this pandemic has needed this to move to the forefront. And now that we have it and it's shown to be safe and highly effective, it's my belief as a scientist, simply looking at the science of it and the data that we need to have more of this to protect us, not from just COVID, this pandemic and the next potential pandemic in the future, but many other hard to treat diseases, many other hard to treat uh, chronic diseases, infectious diseases and other things that this type of a vaccine can address. And I look to a really hopeful future for that reason. So going back to the original point, this is a safe and effective, well understood vaccine. It's not going to put any sort of nanobots or these sorts of things that are rumor and not true into the human body. Uh, there's nine simple ingredients. We know what they are. It does a very simple function for a short period of time. It's training the immune system. We need that boot camp of the immune system to get trained up so that when the attack comes, when we're exposed to that new Delta variant, and they are effective against it. Our immune systems can do the job in a very careful way of eliminating it. Because one of the reasons we need to get vaccinated is because those people that end up on a ventilator or in the hospital, their immune systems overreacted to the virus. It's never seen anything like it before. We need to give it the instructions so it can know that it has seen something like it before so it's more properly regulated when it mounts the attack when we're exposed. And I realize that's pretty complicated. I'm trying to explain it in a really simplified way, um, but you know, let me know if you have questions or if any of those viewers have questions, we can definitely explain that some more. Oh, I can't hear you, uh, David. Essentially, we've been making these sorts of vaccines, as you said, with this technology for decades now, and uh, we know a lot about how they work. And um, we also know, uh, if you listen to the Centers for Disease Control director, that um, we've put how many how many million shots in arms so far in this country, uh, 300 million maybe total doses. And there have been, you know, very, very few complications. So we have some real time experience, right? That uh, mm -hmm. it's working and the science is showing us that if you get vaccinated, uh, you're less likely to have uh, hospitalization and, and some serious symptoms and side effects. So uh, I heard also recently, Nicholas, that this right now, this pandemic is a pandemic of the unvaccinated, mm -hmm. right? the unvaccinated. So how do we change that? Yeah, exactly. That is true. Um, we know as the unvaccinated have made up more than 97% of the hospitalizations, the unvaccinated, and over 99% of the deaths in the recent analysis. So how do we get people to be vaccinated? That's a really great question. There are surveys have shown that about um, substantial portion of those not being vaccinated are just very skeptical or fearful of it. Um, and a substantial number are just waiting. They're waiting to see and hear a little more. Really, I think waiting to see if they really need it or not. Is this pandemic over or is it coming for another round? Well, it's coming for another round. We know that for sure. We can look to other countries and already see it happening. So let's get just really real and honest now about the fear. Um, I would say that tribal communities can be fearful because the healthcare systems have failed them in the past. Uh, some people are very upset. Um, some are afraid. Some are traumatized and angry, fearful, some confused. So, you know, that begs the question, what about today? What about the vaccine? What about during this pandemic? 
I would say that, you know, many people are still afraid that there could be some after effects way down the road we just don't know about today. And I totally understand that concern. In fact, let's talk about that a little bit. Uh, things like the use of certain herbicides or pesticides and things that have been commonplace in the past are over many years starting to show some rare effects and some cancers and other things like that. But let's talk about this vaccine. What you have to know about our immune system and the vaccine is that it's a quick exposure and fast elimination. You, um, also, that when that infection or the vaccine takes place, the challenge to the immune system, um, you typically see any ill effects, bad effects within a few months, if not, and usually even before that, hours, days, or weeks. So you, we can detect that. Uh, and we're not seeing anything of any serious concern right now about these messenger RNA vaccines made by Pfizer and Moderna. In fact, based on what I know of all the work so far is that, you know, we're seeing exceptional safety coming out, out of the use of these. Could there be something two years, five years down the road? I would say, I don't think so, but I don't know if 100% certainty and no one does. But I can say that based upon the evidence of looking at what's happening with these vaccines, having been given, as you said, to millions and millions, many hundreds of millions of people throughout the world, we're not seeing the adverse effects or any long-term effects or medium-term effects from since when they started the trials. Well, Nicholas Hill with the Great Plains Tribal Chairman's Health Board, if you can hang with us, please do. Uh, we're going to come back to you if, if uh, you're able to stay with us. Uh, really appreciate your insights and uh, your expertise in epidemiology and uh, uh, the vaccine 101 reminder too of uh, the MNRA uh, technology behind this. In terms of, as that last question, you know, how do we persuade more people to get vaccinated? The We Can Do This Indian Country campaign uh, is trying to do just that with a number of strategies, really just trying to get people talking and asking questions so that they can inform themselves, right? We're not gonna tell you what to do we just want to put you some information out there, have a conversation, and point you to some resources. And in order to start that conversation, uh, there's some a new social media ad in the works involving uh, a fairly well-known uh, Crow Indian uh, performer and musician uh, known uh, in, on stage as Superman. And during this interview with him a couple of days ago, uh, we get to see a preview of the message to get more people talking about COVID-19 vaccinations. So let's watch uh, this interview I had with Superman a couple days ago. Get vaccinated. Superman, welcome. Please introduce yourself. I know you're very well known, but some of us old codgers might need a reminder of who you are. You bet. Uh, what's up, my relatives? Uh, my name is Christian Parrish, takes the gun, aka Superman. Come from the Absalogan Nation uh, in Montana, or the Crow Nation is the mistranslation of our people. My Absalogan name is which means good fortune on Mother Earth. And my clan is the Ashichira, which is the Big Lodge clan. So yes, it's an honor uh, to be here with you awesome people. I saw you perform at a large national conference, uh, 2019 it was, and you've got this amazing energy. You have a blend of uh, traditional cultural vibe with a more contemporary feel and you just seem to hit all of the notes right and really resonated with the, the whole the whole crowd the, a lot of students there high school and college age and you had even uh, 40s and 50 something on their feet at times i've heard you talk your story before and you've gotten some uh shade so to speak about blending right uh traditional with mm. uh, hip-hop but where has this come from, this uh, center in you that is so expressive and so connecting? When you start doing music, you kind of do it for the fun. You know, it's like, hey, I love this. You know, it's 
I enjoy this, it's fun. And then when you start to become an artist, you know, and you start to have a live performance or somebody's listening to your music that you created, um, then you realize that the impact, you know, you realize the impact that you're having on on the listener or the some uh, the participant at your performance, and so that in itself um, kind of helps me out. You know, I realize that the the positive messaging that was going out was affecting people, you know, in, in a good way, and and it helped them. You know, they uplifted their spirit or you know whatever encouraged them, and so as an artist, you know, to get that feedback um, from what you were creating what you were putting out to get that feedback in a positive way, like then encouraged me and made me wanted to, uh, to move forward, you know, and, and continue on being creative. For the, we can do this Indian country campaign. You've contributed, uh, parts of your music and your, your vibe, your, your way of being. And why don't we play, uh, it's a real short clip that's going to appear on social media and it's still, uh, in the near final process, but let's play it to give the audience, uh, a, a, a taste of it and then we can talk about it honor our past be influenced by those who came before us and rise to make a difference it's easier than ever before to be a modern day warrior let's get vaccinated so we can get back to making history we can do this that's a lot in 15 seconds huh yeah you bet quick 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 where, where were some of those images from uh different powwows and just here uh in crow country you know um yeah just uh what i do i try to like keep it home base too as well you know like being here in billings yeah it's it's billings but it, you know it's it's indian country it's it's crow country uh so yeah it's, like you heard the music there that's uh the infusion right there it's a it's a round dance song you know but it's also you know some hip-hop music at the same time so good vibes um i know you've worked with uh, g and g advertising which is the american indian alaska native a subcontractor for the We Can Do This Indian Country campaign under the uh, Department of Health and Human Services. You've worked with G&G &G before. Uh, what's that back and forth process like? I mean, you're an artist and all artists have a vision, right? It's, it's always good. It's always smooth. You know, we connect good, communication's good, and they're always open to how I feel, you know, especially being an artist and being, you know, have been doing this for so many years. I, I know you know, the community, you know, uh, in Indian country, uh, social media, you know, and all of that. And so I, I know my, my my own audience and how they respond and just uh, the whole community. And so when they had their ideas, you know, we kind of brought them together and cr came up with that, which is awesome. You know, like we can do this. I mean, we've been doing this, you know, like, so we can, we can do this. We've been resilient, you know, for so many years. And so we continue on that. Uh, that legacy carrying our on our carrying on our legacies and, and making history. What's uh, the COVID nineteen experience been like there uh, on the Crow Reservation? Uh, the impact that COVID had, you know, in you know on our res and in, in Montana was bad. You know, it was devastating. Like there was so so much loss of life. You know, like uh, on our reservation, uh, so many elders. You know, language speakers. Um, you know, the cult cultural, um, you know, the historians, you know, they had all this knowledge and then, you know, along comes COVID-19 and just taking out our people in that way. So, you know, we were we were in a state of emergency, in a, in a state of shock, you know, of what to do and, you know, like what's going to happen. And and so, yeah, it's, it's definitely, you know, devastated, um, you know, Indian country in itself. And so to be able to, hey, man, we, what can I do? You know, how, how can we help each other um, be safe? How can we protect our elders? How can we protect our people? And so I think we all kind of have that urgency. How do we persuade people who are still maybe on the fence or skeptical or maybe have turned to other issues? You know, how do we have a conversation with folks to consider getting vaccinated and to pay attention to this now, right? With the uh, variant, that Delta variant uh, supposed to be more uh, transmissible and even more threatening in many ways. How do we get people's attention? We get so in the in the routine of um, oh it's done we're you know it's all good we're no more mask you know things like that we we're easily get in our comfort zone and I think um, at the same time though like the the impact that it did have you know on our families everybody was impacted you know like everybody in you know in our res pretty much lost a, lost somebody you know from COVID. 
And so that kind of like makes people understand that th this is serious business, you know, like we we have to do this, you know, for, for our people uh, to move forward. And so I think uh, staying creative, you know, and, and reaching out to the community and like, in ways like this, you know, like with the with the PSAs and, and just kind of like continuing on, letting people know the info, you know, and it's like, we're not out of the dark, you know, we're not out of the woods yet. We're still, you know, um, let's let's make this you know let's so we don't have to go through this again you know let's let's just solidify this um, protection here let's look at uh what's going to pop up on people's phones in the next couple of weeks uh from this we can do this campaign and tell us what we're seeing here so you're seeing um you know performing so when covid hit you know it was just like boom that was the end there was no gatherings people couldn't go to concerts we couldn't have conferences. We couldn't go to you know ceremonies. We couldn't gather, uh, and so this is what you see is, is me, you know, live performing live again. You know, see the the interaction with the crowd, us coming together again, uh, enjoying one another's um, presence, and so you know that's um, that's where we want to be. You know, that's where we want to be with with this. And so in order to do that, you know, we we gotta. Boom, we got to solidify that, you know, getting vaccinated is one of those ways of where we can solidify that, that protection and that, that peace. Uh, I missed it, you know, for that whole year, you know, there was no interaction and stuff. So, and so when I had a, another gathering, it's just like, hey, uh, this feels good. You know, I forgot how this feels to, to interact, to, you know, shake, shake a person's hand, you know, just to connect with them, you know, physically you realize the value of it. You realize the value of that connection. Let's uh, watch that 15 second spot one more time and pinpoint anything else that, that jumps out at you. Cause it's, uh, there's just so much there in 15 seconds. It's amazing. Honor our past, be influenced by those who came before us and rise to make a difference. It's easier than ever before to be a modern day warrior. Let's get vaccinated so we can get back to making history. We can do this. Yeah, so definitely, you know, honor our past. You know, bam, you got, you got an amazing leader there, you know, Sitting Bull himself, you know, and then you got the, the old footage there of, of, the, of the dancing of people coming together, you know, and then you have the me in my outfit, you know, I'm, I'm there in the, in the modern day world of, of uh, you know, the colonized world, you know, but at the same time, in, enjoying the culture, representing the culture. And then you have the powwow where, hey, this is where we gather, this is where we compete. We enjoy the songs, we enjoy our culture, our dances, and and this is where we heal. You know, this is where, this is healing. So you, you come from the past, honoring the past, onto the journey of healing, you know, and that that's what it's all about. Even in those 15 seconds, you know, it says a lot and it's a very powerful piece. Did you have any questions yourself when when you were thinking about the vaccine and you know what whether you should get it or not uh we all had those questions we all wondered about uh you know what's going to happen is this is this okay for our people and so yeah definitely there's there's always that question of of is it safe you know and so uh and then as i said earlier to have it impact you you know so closely to home you know where you have hey somebody in your family you know they they passed away that makes it uh that kind of wakes you up you know kind of wakes you up to the seriousness of, of the um, of the virus and everything and so i think uh with indian country you know i think a lot of us were like that you know we we had the questions about it and then when it impacted us and we seeing oh hey this is this is affecting our our families um you know i gotta do this i gotta you know i gotta get vaccinated I got to, you know, mask up. I got to do what I got to do to protect, you know, our families. Well, is there anything else that you'd like to add? Uh, I'd just like to thank you, you know, for allowing me to be, you know, a part of this this great campaign. And I hope I do it justice, you know, just um, uh, putting things out there with the community. I'm always trying to do my best, you know, as as an artist, you know, as as a human being. So I'm just, I'm just honored and, and humbled. Um, you know, to be a part of it. Well, that was uh, a lot of fun for for an old codger like myself. Something about his energy is just really cool. Uh, so he took us, Superman took us to Billings and Montana. Uh, Nicholas Hill took us to 
uh, Rapid City, not too far down the road. And now let's go uh, over east to North Dakota, where we're joined by State Representative Ruth Buffalo, uh, who represents the Fargo, North Dakota area. Hi. Hey, thanks for joining us, Representative. How are you? And what's, uh, what's the state of COVID-19 these days in, in your part of Indian country? Did you catch that question, Ruth, or no? No, I'm sorry. What What's the state of COVID-19 in, in your part of Indian country, Representative Buffalo? Um, in North Dakota, we're still working on increasing our uh, vaccination rates. And so, you know, nationally, uh, North Dakota is a challenging state in terms of um, getting the vaccine. But Indian country is leading in that respect um, in terms of like getting the vaccine. But North Dakota as a whole, we have challenges there. Um, and so we're still really encouraging people to um, get the vaccine in order to um help others uh, live longer. Right. Uh, I don't know if you could could hear it there in your in your vehicle, but we uh, had an interview with Superman, uh, the the Crow tribal performer, and one of his messages, right, was uh, together we overcome, right? Together we can do this. Uh, that's a message that Indian country gets, right? We're not individuals were connected to each other uh, but we also live in parts of the country that don't have that orientation all the time right that are very individualistic and are all are about so-called personal freedom and that has to rub off on us a little bit perhaps right when our our next door neighbors uh, are looking at you know freedom masks and you know or freedom unmasked how, how, how do we how does that fit there where, where you live um that's exactly it you know we uh, tribal communities you know i'm born you know well raised in fort berthold indian reservation i was going to say born we're all all of us who the majority of us who are who are from mandaree we were born in watford city which is 27 miles away um have 94 percent of our agricultural land not been flooded as a result of the pick sloan act in the early 1950s we would have been actually born you know at elbow woods um which is underwater but so aside from that yes growing up on on fort berthold indian reservation you know um we always went to dickinson which was 85 miles south of us to get groceries uh, and so we as tribal members you know my mom, my entire family still lives in Mandaree, and so they frequent Minot, Dickinson, uh, Watford City a lot to get groceries and to get their, you know, additional services. And so it's just uh, common sense to help our neighbors out um, who might be more susceptible to not surviving COVID-19. So it just makes sense to, to do our part in order to protect everyone, um, regardless of it, if it's an inconvenience to wear masks, regardless of it, if you don't believe in the vaccine, you're actually helping the greater good um, by getting the vaccine. Yeah, thank you. And uh, be careful driving there. I, I love how you're multitasking, um, driver, mom, interviewer, all, all at once. <laughs> um, you are an elected official and always trying to have conversations right uh, in order to, to make progress whether it's people of a like mind trying to get them on board people of a different mind trying to come together to do something you know to make progress what have you found are some of your strategies around having conversations across these differences right so that we can uh come together around anything i think just finding common ground um we're, we're all human beings and we all want safe communities and stronger communities and hello you're back sorry had an incoming call but um just finding common ground, you know, just having a conversation one-on-one -on -one with each other. Uh, we find more similarities than we do differences, you know, and, and a common theme uh, 
uh, one sure way to find a way to build relationships in what would be considered a hostile environment at times is through humor. Um, and so uh, everybody loves to, to laugh and, and to joke. And that's been one sure way that I've found uh, a way to build relationships is, is finding ways to laugh and, and find humor in things. Mm. Uh, good point. And right, even with some of the more difficult challenges in life uh, or tensions, if you will, right, in those differences, uh, a joke about it can go a lot further than uh, hitting the nail on the head or or what have you. So that's a, there's a lot of wisdom there. Uh, is there anything else that you'd like to add, uh, Representative Ruth Buffalo uh, from North Dakota regarding the pandemic and, and what's next for your constituents and your MHA tribal people? Yeah, I just want to acknowledge the mourners and, you know, I think I truly believe that you know, from a public health thing and, you know, getting to the root cause. And we know throughout Indian country, we've had um, historic policies that really were a detriment to our, our population's health. And so finding ways to really uh, work upstream, you know, and find ways to prevent uh, further chronic illnesses and disease um, is really needed. And so I hope that we can continue to you know, be good to one another and, and really find ways to help each other live longer. Um, so that's all I have to add at this point. So I just want to say thank you, Madzigadads, for having me. Well, thank you for taking time. Drive safely and uh, uh, love to to hear from you uh, in the future on this subject because uh, I have a feeling we're in it for the long haul. So uh, take care and, and appreciate you uh, joining us tonight. Representative Ruth Buffalo of North Dakota. Well, this is uh, We Can Do This Indian Country, a town hall focused on the Great Plains. And we've uh, touched on Montana, North Dakota, South Dakota. I'm based in Minnesota, which isn't uh, considered the plains, but maybe maybe the sliver of the state to the west. Um, this is a campaign uh, under the Department, U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, uh, also partnering with the Indian Health Service. And tonight, uh, the Great Plains Tribal Chairman's Health Board. But there's a number of resources on wecandothis.hhs.gov that I'd like to point out. Uh, and there's a literally a, a, a very prominent link right now to misinformation uh, about the campaign. And so if you go to uh, hhs. or wecandothis.hhs.gov, uh, confronting COVID-19 vaccine misinformation is right there in the upper right. And click on that and check it out. And if anything, it's a conver conversation starter uh, with folks about, hey, you know, why haven't you been vaccinated? Uh, you know, the they've been offering these down at the clinic for for months now. There's plenty of vaccine to go around let's just go get it done, right? Uh, oftentimes you don't even need an appointment. Um, I was just traveling and um, happened to be in the airport and literally there's, you know, there's a little setup, a kind of a pop-up vaccination stand in the airport. So uh, there's vaccine available. And if you've got questions about it, go to wecandothis.hhs.gov and check out the vaccine misinformation. Uh, there's also resources there uh, appropriate for the American Indian Alaska Native uh, community, uh, including flyers and uh, specific specific information for Native American people and communities. So go go to the website, check it out. We can do this. Hhs. Gov. There's also a link uh, to an interview conducted not too long ago with the uh, CDC, the Centers for D Disease Control director. Uh, Rochelle Walensky, who talked about uh, the Delta variant, uh, the vaccine safety, and she's uh, talking to Ryan Seacrest. So he, you know, he cuts to the point and makes it very accessible. So if you're looking for uh, something to do after we're done with this conversation, go check that out. 
uh, very compelling information about uh, vaccine and, and efficiency, effect of efficacy, and, and why it's so necessary. So please uh, check that out. We can do this. Hhs.gov. Uh, earlier we heard from Superman. Uh, together we can overcome. And the next phase of, of these campaigns for a while now has been focused on children. Children 12 and older are eligible. Right, it's, the vaccine has been proven to be safe with adolescents uh, down to 12 year old. And uh, as we heard earlier from uh, Nicholas Hill, an epidemiologist with the Great Plains Tribal Chairman's Health Board, uh, we need to shift from focusing on elders first to now let's get our children vaccinated so that they can go back to school uh, so that we don't see what's happened, uh, according to Nicholas, in England and the United Kingdom, where uh, more uh, devastating impacts of the coronavirus with this Delta variant are impacting young people, uh, teenagers, 20-somethings, uh, who are who are getting terribly sick. Um, and, and Nicholas is worried that that could be the trend in this country. So in order to continue this conversation, I wanted to bring in uh, a mom and uh, a community advocate from uh, the great state of Oklahoma, where our, I don't know, 37 federally recognized tribes, there's quite a few down in Oklahoma, but Jaysha Lyons Echohawk, who's a member of the Seminole Nation, uh, thank you so much for joining us. I hope you're uh, doing well tonight, and we appreciate your time. I love your backdrop there. Uh, you want to introduce yourself and then uh, let us know about the status of COVID-19 uh, in your community? For sure. Um, Mado, thank you for having me. No Akitaru Tatasa Titata Chikstariku, Stone Go, Jaysha Lyons Echohawk, Chaha Jakados. Hello, everyone. My name is Jaysha Lyons Echohawk. I'm actually an intertribal love song. I'm enrolled uh, with the Seminole Nation of Oklahoma, but I'm also a member of uh, the Pawnee Creek Omaha and Iowa tribes. Um, and I actually reside in Pawnee territory here in Oklahoma. Um, so, uh, very. Uh, again, honored um, to be here uh, amongst uh, some of these folks you've already interviewed thus far. Um, and uh, yeah, I'm um, a birth worker, a student midwife, um, current grad student um, with the University of Oklahoma's College of Law, um, Master of Legal Studies, Indigenous Peoples Law Program. Um, and like you mentioned, a community advocate, um, usually just um, that's how I got acquainted with um, some of the folks um, that, you, that are behind the scenes for this campaign um, because of a variety of campaigns that I've actually been um, commissioned to do um, during this pandemic. One of them being the census and convincing our folks to be counted as well as getting out the vote in Indian country. What, uh, I, I love the intertribal love story. I think that could be our next message. Um, <laughs> Uh, for you and, and some of your people to help us do, uh, right? Because this is a intertribal love story. I mean, if we're going to really take on COVID and the next pandemic and the next challenge in our communities, right, we've got to do it together. And and in our communities, values, right, values drive it all mm -hmm. from, gen from generosity to reciprocity to taking care of each other and, you know, uh, expressing love if, if that's what it is. Uh, what's COVID-19 like their uh, vaccines and the, what's the talk uh, in and around Seminole and Pawnee country there? Um, unfortunately, some of our folks that have been uh, um, vaccinated are getting, um, are, are, have been, you know, had several exposures to folks who have caught the variant. And um, a lot of these folks that have caught the variant are unvaccinated. And so um, many of us, especially those of us that are vaccinated have, you know, gone back to wearing masks or going to those um, COVID-19 protocols that, you know, that have been in existence um, since, you know, last March. Um, you know, we're still trying to uh, continue and carry on in the best ways. Um, that makes sense, you know, culturally or when there's community events. And yet, um, you know, the threat exists. I was just with um, some relatives over this past weekend 
um, one of the babies that, um, or one of the families that I helped supported um, during the birth of this baby, um, they had a laughing party and we, you know, all the folks that were there um, more or less were vaccinated, you know, those folks 12 uh, years of age and over were um, vaccinated. So we felt safe to be um, in this event outside um, and just hearing how um, one of these relatives who had a um, brother um, who had been vaccinated, uh, unfortunately was um, in the hospital because they contracted COVID-19. However, they had comorbidities. So um, there was a, uh, a, a, a concern that this person was not going to live um, through this uh, battle. Uh, and, you know, there's no way to know how they contracted the vaccine. However, when you look at the rates within um, the state and even within the county that I reside, we're um, in the county that I reside, we're at 34% um, fully vaccinated. And the state of Oklahoma, um, as it's known, um, Indian Territory is vaccinated at a rate of about 39 or 40 percent, um, which is definitely not at the rate we need for um, herd immunity or to be able to safely go out into larger spaces and places, you know, maskless. You you mentioned working with uh, mothers, mothers-to-be and through the, the birthing process and with families. Uh, mm -hmm. How do you help folks understand uh, the importance of, of getting vaccinated, uh, right? In the beginning, it was for our elders, but now, right, the focus is more and more on younger people and the unvaccinated as this pandemic becomes a pandemic of the unvaccinated in many ways. So um, working with parents to be and their respective families, um, it really has, yeah, been challenging to make sure everybody has the proper information um, during the census effort, you know, some of the uh, work that I did, uh, we were able to, well, a lot of our work was virtual, just like this, you know, we did um, these kind of live stream events. Um, and because people are pulling their information from social media sources, I think it's somewhere like 70% of our population, uh, the US population pulls their information sources from social media platforms. So it could be like Facebook, could be YouTube, could be Twitter. Um, even, you know, Instagram and TikTok. Um, so making sure that the information that they're catching is correct, is factual, is evidence-based. And a lot of what I could pull during this time, because um, I'm also a lactation advocate, was ensuring that um, as much research that was possible, um, you know, was available to these folks. You know, I can't push, you know, anything on them. However, I do um, recognize, you know, we are uh, a community as Native people that are disproportionately impacted by hospitalization um, because of COVID-19 and, and, you know, death at that. Um, so ensuring that these families were safe at this time, ensuring that um, they were making their, you know, best or informed decisions. And more often than not, um, these pregnant people were um, were were uh, getting the vaccine um, to protect themselves and their and their children. Um, some of the birth uh, of these native uh, people were more often in the hospitals. So I think that. Um, what was expressed to me was the concern of catching COVID in the hospital. So uh, if that's where they had to deliver, then they wanted to make sure that they were um, they were as safe as possible. And then in terms of lactation or being able to um, express milk from body to baby, um, that's also shown to be, um, you know, a very low risk uh, in terms of, you know, any complication from the vaccine, like it's more or less... Um, a, uh, like the uh, benefits outweigh um, any risk. And so there's a lot of um, lactating parents who have safely received the vaccine and been able to continue safely um, expressing milk to their babies. Um, so that's been, yeah, where I've been able to play a part in this community role. What I understand your your daughter is also vaccinated or chose to be vaccinated and you made that family decision. Uh, what what was that like? Um, well, uh, we are a family of six and I was the one who caught COVID in our house and it didn't feel inevitable. It actually was quite a surprise for our family um, because I was one of the most um, vigilant folks. Um, I was the one that had to go, um, you know, do the uh, 
chauffeuring or the, um, you know, like running to pick up food or groceries. And even in this community work, you know, going to be with these families or doing mutual aid. So I took a lot of precautions to make sure that I, you know, was keeping myself safe as possible and not bringing it back to my house because I, we do have immunocompromised folks in our home. And um, thankfully, I guess my, you know, my infection was not um, severe. I didn't have um, too many long-term effects, but I definitely wasn't hospitalized. And um, so I think, you know, that probably played part of, um, you know, oh, or definitely weighed in her decision. Um, again, we uh, shared information. There was, uh, for us, it was more of a family conversation and it came down to really her just feeling like, yeah, this is what I want to do. This is what I think I need to do. She plays uh, sports. And so it was really difficult for her this year. Um, and our school, our school district was one that did like a either or, either you were in person or you were virtual. And the virtual is really tough. That's what we initially started off with, with um, the three kids who were going to school, um, started off virtually. Um, and it was a real struggle um, and equity in, in, that, in that way. You know, we um, did our due diligence with <laughs> advocating to the school board, especially on behalf of these Indian kids that, you know, our community is comprised of. And, um, and then when we, um, you know, decided to go ahead and put them in the school system, we were almost nearly immediately like those kids were exposed. One of the kids was exposed in, in one um, grade and then the other kid like two weeks later was exposed. And then um, another two weeks, like within the six weeks left of school, all three were exposed and had to be quarantined. Um, so then, you know, they couldn't participate in any athletics or anything like that. By the springtime, you know, it was very limited what we were um, accepting or what we thought would be okay to do. Um, you know, everything's kind of with its own risk. And um, I think that's also played a part in the decision that uh, she felt she could make for herself. And so, um, yeah, we felt like the information that we had um, all the things that we could read that, um, again, was evidence-based, as much research that was out there. Um, and she and many of her friends um, were all talking about, you know, getting the vaccine and who got it and when they got it, taking selfies, taking pictures, um, and posting them, you know, to their own socials. So thank you for asking. Well, and everyone's healthy at the moment, then. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, we feel, we feel safe. <laughs> well, I can relate to the issue with sports. I've got two daughters myself, and the younger one is a soccer player, and uh, I haven't seen her play soccer in, I don't know, 19 months, you know, mm -hmm. and uh, she actually went to, to college to, to, you know, be a student athlete, and her team went through uh, some really off and on practices, no games at all last fall. And then practice was, you know, hit or miss, depending. And then there were some infections on the team. And then, you know, poof. Yeah. Um, so it's it's just been really tough on our kids. And uh, to get them vaccinated and to listen to folks like you to start the conversation, who's obviously so tuned to this. Uh, Jason, stay with us. I want to bring in uh, our, our last guest, but not our not least by any means, uh, <laughs> Dale Knutson. Uh, member of the Oglala Sioux Tribe and uh, works for the Great Plains Tribal Chairman's Health Board. And we're so grateful to have uh, the participation of you, uh, Dale, and your colleague, Nicholas Hill, earlier. And Nicholas is still with us, and we might bring him back in a second here. Uh, Gail, what's, Dale, what is the, the status of COVID-19 and your work as a nurse on the front lines of literally trying to put needles in arms uh, there in the in the large landmass and population base that you serve in southwestern South Dakota? So the current status is, is we continue to offer vaccines in um, multiple different forums. We go out into the communities. We have a mobile unit that we um, post our um, most current uh, PSAs for where we're going on our Facebook page because that does um, change, but not often. We go um, certain locations every Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday with that mobile unit to offer vaccines across the reservation uh, at Pine Ridge. 
Um, but as uh, I'm actually the chief nurse for Indian Health Service for the Great Plains area, I do a lot of on-site help at Pine Ridge right now because we're very thin. We're very spread thin and spread far. And with nursing staff, it's all boots on the ground right now. And um, I do want to do a shout out to our nurses and our uh, pharmacists and our providers that have, everybody has done just a phenomenal job throughout um, Indian country in not only offering testing, but then quickly turning to offering vaccines and offering vaccines in different methods than we have done um, historically before. And that's taken a great amount of partnership with our tribal health partners um, and our communities abroad. We also brought uh, in the spring a couple, we partnered with FEMA, Indian Health Service partnered with FEMA and we ran a truck, two trucks simultaneously, one across North Dakota and one across South Dakota um, and partnered with our Indian Health Service clinic, clinical folks to offer the vaccine. FEMA provided the mobile unit and supplies. And we have really tried to um, work outside of our normal boxes or our normal workflows. And that's that's taken a, a great amount of challenge, but it's been uh, very, uh, extremely rewarding. Well, well, thank you for your efforts. Uh, and Dale, and you talked about partnership and I apologize. I. I uh, connected you very closely to the Chairman's Health Board as a as a employee, but you actually work with Indian Health Service, and they're one of our best partners. <laughs> um, and I should have known that because earlier you were talking about the Aberdeen area office, and uh, yours truly here was born in Aberdeen on a really cold November night because my dad was working at the area office there back in the day. So uh, circles come back full circle. What what? What do you, if you if you could wave a wand, right? If you could wave a wand, and I know it's not something that we ask scientists and medical people, but what? How do we get in front of this, right? How do we get in front of this? You've talked about being stretched thin uh, yourself, so that's one one thing to address. Uh, I know some some com communities have deputized other people, right, mm -hmm. to to give vaccinations, but what what do we need to do? Uh, to get people to, to to increase the demand, really, right? Well, that's interesting. And I think, you know, I, I often say if they would make me clean for a day, uh, laughingly at work. Um, however, I think the most important thing we can do to learn about our future is to reach back to our past and look at the different challenges and, and evaluate how um, folks dealt with those challenges in the past. And with communicable disease like COVID that has large transmission rates um, and knows no bounds uh, for all ages and all races, um, we do need to look back to the past and see how we as scientists, as people, have been able to get ahead of that. And one of the greatest resources we have historically is vaccine. Um, there's a lot of fear around vaccines. How are they made? Uh, and, and of course the mRNA vaccine is a new, relatively new way. It's perceived as new um, to the mainstream folks. But as Dr. Kill indicated, this has been this this method has been around and has been researched for many years. And now globally, we have given millions of doses and it's been very safe and very effective. And the other thing I think um, that I haven't already heard mentioned is that there is more transparency um, through our vaccine efforts. And when scientists are reviewing vaccine data through the vaccine adverse events reporting, um, and mechanisms like that, it's immediately in the news. So that leads to a lot of transparency, um, which I think and hope will give people confidence that um, no one is taking this very lightly. This is serious. It's affected us all in a very um, harmful and negative way. And there's just so much about the long-term effects of this disease that we don't know that there's a lot of things we just won't know for the next several years. Um, some of you may have heard the term long haulers and that's some of our 
um, individuals that have had infection and they just can't get over the symptoms. Many of them have um, multiple chronic diseases they're dealing with and because of that um, they're not recovering um, as would be expected and so the the clear thing is that this disease impacts people very differently for a wide variety of reasons and sometimes we don't know why it's so severe in a seemingly healthy person and, and Dr. Hill spoke very eloquently of that earlier regarding the children. And we do need to look across the ocean to see what's happening in our, in our um, countries, in the young people, because right now uh, this Delta variant is very easily um, spread from one person to another. And that's the population that's unvaccinated primarily right now. So they're gonna catch it they're going to spread it and right now we just don't know how what the short-term or long-term effect is going to be on that we do have very good vaccines available and even if the vaccine does not fully protect because no vaccine in the world is 100 percent there these vaccines have a very high efficacy rate um, for pre protecting people but what we do know about covid vaccine as well as other vaccines is if you have the vaccine, um, it can protect you if you do get the disease from having a, it'll give you a milder case. So the case, if you hadn't have been vaccinated, could have been very severe, but you do have that somewhat level of protection. I think Dr. Hill said it very well when he said that the body has recognized this before because the people that wound up in the ICUs had a hypersensitive or a, a really big response because the body hadn't seen this virus before. And that does happen in some people, but if we give them the vaccine, the body recognizes it and it's built up some immunity against it and it doesn't go into that hypersensitive mode. Um, so people have the disease, but they do recover. Thank you for uh, explaining that. Um, and just we have a couple questions that have come uh, through the through the comment section, and I'd ask uh, Nicholas Hill just to come back uh, on screen too, so in case he wants to take a crack at some of these questions. Uh, but one of the questions is uh, in terms of how people are affected by the vaccine, right? Uh, that was one of the concerns, you know, maybe when the vaccines were first available. I got my vaccine, I think, April, mid-April, and you know, my arm was quite sore for 24 hours or so, and I kind of felt tired, but but that was about it. Other folks, some folks had no, uh, right, no reaction, and then others were kind of, uh, felt like they had the flu or something, right, for uh, maybe a day or two. Uh, mm -hmm. Is there any difference in body type in terms of the, what you all have seen or read or heard in terms of you know, large people versus smaller people, you know, reacting to the vaccines differently? Uh, you know, I really haven't seen the data that shows uh, the stature or stat, you know, size of a body size of a person having uh, the effect. Um, but it does vary. It varies from person to person, just as you mentioned. And it varies according to, um, you know, the person. It depends on, uh, various elements of inflammation that happens after the uh, challenge has occurred with the vaccine. When I had mine, and most people, when they have theirs, so that first dose, they don't have typically a reaction, maybe a little sore arm, especially if you put that needle alongside or through a nerve or something like that. Yes, this can happen. Uh, that doesn't damage anything relating to you no know, long-term effects. It's just the needle going in the arm uh, and delivering the vaccine after the second dose the immune system is primed and usually if someone's going to have a reaction it's going to be redness soreness of that arm and it is going to be feeling fatigued and run down that's basically a measure and actually some good assurance perhaps that the vaccine's challenging the immune system and the immune system is responding and doing what's needed and necessary uh, I, I figured that was like a badge of uh, assurance for me I walked around saying, yeah, I felt like I was pretty run down after that second vaccine dose. Boy, I'm ready to 
take on the world now. I don't have to be afraid of this virus. Uh, and uh, I would say that uh, for people that are kind of concerned, uh, do talk to other people who have had the vaccine and continue to, um, you know, learn, continue to learn about what it takes to, uh, you know, to get through that. If you're someone who you think might have that inflammatory reaction and, you know, be, you know, for 24 hours be in really bad shape, you can take ibuprofen and you can take Tylenol. Mm -hmm. And I would recommend, uh, you know, especially taking that. You can even take it before a reaction would like that could occur. Uh, as long as you could have taken the ibuprofen or Tylenol in the past before and it's safe for you, by all means, take that and that will really help you through it. Yeah, that's exactly how I felt on that second dose was was like it was it must have been working. I, I like how you frame that. What are, what's your advice uh, in terms of helping if people want to find the vaccine in, in their community, in their uh, district? What's the best way to go about that? Say, uh, Dale, how do you answer that question? I, I want the vaccine. What do I do? How do I find it? So the best thing to do is to reach out to your local uh, healthcare institution, whether that's a tribal health clinic or the Indian Health Service. Um, most of those programs have Facebook pages, uh, so you can search social media to see. Um, we're always putting our most current public service announcements up there, indicating where we're at and how long we're going to be there. I do want to stress that uh, I want people to be prepared because one of the things that COVID did was made people fearful of coming to their hospitals and clinics for routine care. And another thing we have seen as a bad outcome of COVID is that we have um, a lot lower rates in our routine childhood uh, immunizations and not just childhood, but from infant to elder you know, across a person's lifespan, there are uh, multitudes of vaccines that we give to prevent disease. And so in order to um, counteract that, what all of our Indian health um, programs are doing and many of our tribal programs are doing is to try to offer lifespan vaccines. We have every vaccine that's available, even if we're there for a COVID clinic. So we're trying to really encourage people to, you know, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. Uh, I'm an old public health nurse at heart, and I can't stress that enough. We have to prevent things from happening when we can. And so we, we not only will be offering you a COVID vaccine, but if you're due for a tetanus shot and it's been 10 years, you're probably going to get offered that as well. And I encourage you to take it. The science has shown that um, us giving these vaccines uh, with one another in conjunction is safe. And um, we encourage that. And we, a lot of times people need a couple of boosters for the COVID. If you choose the Pfizer or Moderna as your uh, vaccine, you will get two doses of that. So you have an opportunity to um, maybe if you have other vaccines, get those at two different times. If you have the J&J, &J, I strongly encourage you to um, accept any other vaccines that are offered to you at that time as well. But if it doesn't work for you, uh, that's fine because we are available anytime you can make it to our walk-in clinics. We have a lot of walk-in clinics. We have tents set up outside some of the, um, some of the um, facilities and sometimes we're taking mobile trucks out and really parking in the middle of a district and be in there all day to offer what we can. And and I would just um, echo what Dr. Kill said about the question regarding um, body stature. There has not been any um, difference in that. Uh, the vaccines do go in the muscle of the upper arm. Um, and so we really haven't seen any difference in responses. And I do like to try to talk to people about what is a reaction um, versus what is an expected response from any vaccine. And a lot of things that people talk about, oh, I had a really bad reaction to a vaccine in the general population, they're talking about my arm got hot, it might have gotten swollen, where I got that shot, I might have got a little bump under there. That's actually an expected reaction um, to a vaccine. And the COVID vaccine does have some of that in some people. And many people report having nothing at all. Maybe um, they felt it when they went to sleep that night if they're a side sleeper. 
And so it really just depends on the person. Um, and, and I would also echo what he said about having the confidence that if you do kind of feel that after you get that first or second dose, that is evidence that the vaccine is doing exactly what it should be doing. The body's recognizing that um, and making an antibody against it, which is exactly what our immune system is supposed to do. Thank you. Uh, Jaysha, I wanted to ask you if, if folks in your part of Oklahoma were looking for the vaccine, is it fairly easy to find or what would your advice be to them? Yeah, I think so. Um, where we're located, we um, have an Indian health clinic here in the Pawnee area, uh, north central Oklahoma. And in fact, pri uh, when they um, were opening the vaccine, through these different tier systems that we have here in Oklahoma or the different priority systems. And um, many folks were coming out of the way to come here to get the vaccine because um, we do have a really great team that does work at this particular clinic. Um, anybody, any complaints I had before COVID <laughs> kind of out the door um, because of how they um, were effectively testing folks. Um, and then the way that they operated their vaccinations um, through the, to the public. Uh, it's been really, really accessible um, and pretty, you know, pretty efficient, so. Well, before we uh, close our conversation, Jaysha, is there any final comments or thoughts you'd like to offer? Um, as a birth worker, you know, we always tell people like to make the best informed decision possible, even as somebody who's advocated for civic engagement, such as voting, you know, please um, make sure that your research is credible, um, that the information you're getting is, you know, through a credible person, if it's, you know, a, um, an oral type of story, you know, somebody giving their testimony um, about the vaccine. Um, and then also anything you read comes from um, a credible source, uh, so that you can make the best decision for you and your family. And I think, you know, as Superman mentioned, you know, all of us have been touched um, in some um, dramatic and drastic way um, during this pandemic with the loss of loved ones, um, culture bearers, and we can't, you know, really afford to lose any more. We need our um, future um, as much as we need to, you know, reflect on those um, foundations of the past. Um, and thank you for having me, Mado. Mm. Well, thank you for all your work uh, working with, with mothers-to-be at the beginning of that sacred journey and uh, for your, uh, your, your Echo Hawk name, I'm sure, also brings a lot of responsibilities now. You've married into that, that high-powered family of uh, community leaders, so thank you for taking time tonight. You mentioned uh, Superman, and before I offer final words to uh, Nicholas Hill and to Dale Knutson, let's uh, watch the coming soon uh, 15 second on your phone uh, shot in the arm because this thing is packed with uh, energy and information uh, from the We Can Do This Indian Country campaign. Let's watch Superman one more time and we'll come back uh, to Dale and Nicholas. Honor our past, be influenced by those who came before us, and rise to make a difference. It's easier than ever before to be a modern day warrior. Let's get vaccinated so we can get back to making history. We can do this. Superman. I wish I was that cool. Um, Nicholas, you're closer. Thank you for joining us tonight. And uh, please thank Geraldine Church uh, and all your colleagues for, for all your efforts with the, the health board. These health boards are so critical, right? Because they are uh, mirror sister cousin brothers to the Indian Health Service. Uh, Nicholas, what are your final thoughts as we uh, close our conversation tonight? Yeah, it's such an honor to be here. I'm so thankful for this opportunity to serve, serve with a full heart. Um, I would offer that people fear what they see we're conditioned to fear that, whether it's a charging animal or you know a flash of lightning and a crack of thunder, you know we we retreat or we take action to protect ourselves. Um, this COVID virus is the worst virus most people will ever come across in their whole life, 
They were not conditioned to understand the threat that it could come from the breathing or maybe the sniffling cough or sneeze of a loved one. And the reality is that that is more of a risk than getting the chance of hospitalization is, is greater from that than it is from that strike of lightning while being out in a lightning storm. And that's so hard to understand and think about. Um, President Kennedy said, you know, ask not what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country. Now insert in that phrase, your sovereign nation, your tribal community, your family members, your loved ones, your friends, your elders, and your youth. Um, ask what you can do for them. Getting vaccinated really is probably a relatively small risk that you'll end up in the hospital. It's not small, but it's small relative to a lot of threats now. But over the course of everyone who is in your community, it's high as a whole for certain people. So you have to really think about getting vaccinated. Don't think about yourself. Think about what you can do for those that you love. And I think the reality is schools, um, tribal colleges, universities um, are all going to be opening up soon. We know from the United Kingdom that um, transmission among the youth are driving that epidemic now. We're going to see that happen here. We're going to see this threat increase. As that happens, we need to take good precautions. But this time, we're it's a different situation. We have the most effective tool in the toolbox possible, and that's vaccination. So please consider using that. Tools are meant for their use, and please consider to protect not only yourself, but those you love. And thank you so much for this chance to talk. Thank you for, for your, your time and your commitment to, to uh, Native American health, Nicholas. Uh, Dale, um, thank you for, I'm sure, <laughs> some long, long days of the last uh, 15, 16 months since the pandemic started. Um, what keeps you going, you know, on those those long days and those long drives from Wambly to, to Martin to cross the over to Oglala and Pier and wherever else you have to go? Ooh, North Dakota, South Dakota, <laughs> Iowa, Nebraska. Um, you know, what keeps me going is that, especially when the vaccine became available, um, I would have stayed up 24 seven. And I know a lot of my healthcare colleagues feel the same because one more arm that we could get in into meant one more person or one more family member that was protected from, from COVID. Um, and I, I just encourage anybody who is still thinking about getting the vaccine Go to the people that you trust with your healthcare decisions. Take the time to have those conversations and get your questions answered. That's what we're here for. Uh, we, we're we not here to pressure people to make a decision, but we do want you to have the best information available. And we will take that time to answer every question that you have to make you confident in getting a vaccine and making that decision for yourself. There's a lot of healthcare decisions that we wind up having to make across the course of our lifetime. And um, while some people, this is a simple decision, others it's not. And we wanna make sure that you feel confident in uh, the decision that you make around vaccine. Well, thank you so much uh, for your time. Um, it's almost Friday. I hope you're looking forward to the weekend and, and resting up and coming back strong uh, next week. Uh, I was, uh, this is the We Can Do This Indian Country Plains uh, Community Edition. Uh, it's been great to have these conversations from the Southwest to Montana, now to the Plains. And uh, our sponsors are the Department of Health and Human Services and the Indian Health Service, and tonight the Great Plains Tribal Chairman's Health Board. Uh, go to wecandothis.hhs.gov and check out that information. As uh, Dale said, uh, get some good information. As Jaisha said, check your sources. If it's someone sharing a personal anecdote, uh, ask more. You know, this is what I heard you say. Is this what you really meant? Let's uh, keep this talk. It's this conversation going. Uh, we heard earlier from Representative Buffalo about bridging differences and how do we do that. Uh, let's find a way to work with uh, folks that might not see it the way we do, 
but if it's about our young kids and getting sports and getting school back to some sense of normal, uh, this vaccination is one of the tools in the toolbox, as Nicholas Hill said. I want to leave you tonight. I was uh, blessed to uh, take a trip to Navajo country last weekend, and the many of the tribes in the Southwest uh, haven't stopped wearing masks, right? Some of us went to Walmart two months ago, and suddenly we don't have to have our masks on anymore, or we went to the restaurant. Let me show you a couple pictures uh, in my travels. Uh, this is uh, Dr. Crystal Tuli Cordova, who's the principal hydrologist for the Navajo Nation. This was Monday. This was just Monday. And she's at more than a couple dozen water stations that she and colleagues helped create on the Navajo Nation. You remember reading the, the accounts of a lack of running water in hundreds, if not thousands of homes there, right? And so they created these these safe water stations where they tested the water and there wasn't, you know, uh, arsenic and other poisons in the water just in response to COVID. But uh, Dr. Tuli Cordova there is still wearing that mask, you know, even as she's filled her water bottle for the day. Um, let me show you a couple more pictures. Uh, this is Deb Tiwa from the Hopi tribe. And I saw her leading uh, some training for solar energy. And she had young people at this training, 20 somethings, two tribal college students, at least that I remember uh, hearing and talking to, you know, young 20 somethings, a three day training. And during the course of that training, they had their masks on the entire time. When you go into restaurants, when you go into hotels run by tribes, the staff are still wearing masks. They never stopped. And so I was just struck by the dedication uh, of, of the tribal people there. And it's just, a, to me, another sign that we can do this. We can take whatever step is necessary, whether it's, you know, getting the vaccine or masking up, right? It's about another ounce of prevention, as uh, Nurse Dale said, right? It's just one more thing that we can do to protect the people around us. So thank you for watching tonight, everybody. Uh, we can do this Indian country. Check out we can do this.hhs.gov or vaccines.gov. And thank you very much to all of our guests tonight. Uh, Nicholas Hill, Dale Knutson, Jaysha Lyons Echohawk, and Representative Ruth Buffalo from Fargo, North Dakota, and the MHA Nation. Good night, stay safe, and keep the conversation going.